Distinguished colleagues, honored guests, Dobre Juto, good morning. <laughs> you have now heard the majority of my Serbian vocabulary. Before I begin, I want to comment on the wonderful long relationship that has existed between the University of Novi Sad and Portland State University. For more than 20 years, we have had this wonderful relationship, and to me, the most satisfying part about that is coming here again and seeing so many of my former students who have joined us at Portland State University who have studied there and have now come back here and become very successful. So to all of those students, I give you congratulations. First of all, I would like to uh, extend my congratulations and, and uh, my sincere appreciation to Dr. Darko for providing the translations that you see here. So the first question then is, why should we worry about supply chain management? With all deference to our accounting, our, our finance of colleagues here today, if you look at most finance books, the first thing they tell you is that the fundamental objective of any organization is to maximize shareholder value. I would suggest to you that that's an outcome. That's not the, the fundamental. It's an outcome of managing our supply chains really well. If we find the very best suppliers that we can anywhere in the world, we develop long-term, close, collaborative relationships with them, we also manage our transportation and logistics efficiently. We plan and manage our inventories really well and control our production and our distribution of finished product. We take that entire supply chain and manage it really well and most cost effectively. It's very easy to sell product even in a competitive environment and make a lot of money. If we make a lot of money, our stock goes up. Right? So the whole thought here is that the appreciation of stock value is a consequence of managing our supply chains truly well. If we manage our supply chains badly, if our costs are not under control at each level, then it's very nearly impossible to sell product in a highly competitive global environment and still make good money. So perhaps it would be worthwhile for us to consider supply chain management a little bit. Uh, a wise man once said that you don't make money in business when you sell. You make money in business when you buy. And I think that's worth considering. If I buy really well, then it's easy to make a profit. If I pay too much, it's very difficult to make a profit. Today, we see that our, our uh, supply chains have undergone a dramatic change. They are much more extensive, they are lengthy, they uh, go all the way around the world to organizations like our, our uh, Asian suppliers. They have become far more complex as we address the requirements of global business, and they become much more geographically dispersed. We'll talk more about that in a little while. The global nature of our supply chains then creates significant uncertainty, and from that comes supply chain risk. So this is the first of the two uh, leading concerns that supply chain managers have today, supply chain risk. I would suggest for you that most of the research on supply chain risk has focused on the buying firm and then the downstream suppliers to that buying firm. But I would also suggest to you that perhaps that's a short-sighted view. The firm itself is a significant part of the supply chain, as are all the connections that flow upstream to our final customers. So if we look at supply chain management in its broader context, we look at all the way from our final customers all the way back down to our, our lowest level of suppliers. 
how well we manage the flow of materials up and down that supply chain will very often define whether or not we make any money. So I would suggest that, that first of all, we need to look at the broader context of supply chain management. In spite of some heroic efforts uh, to catalog supply chain risks, most notably uh, Jared's work in, in 2012, which appeared in the uh, Serbian Journal of Management, and the website that he created to, uh, to further that, it's really impossible to determine every single potential risk for every single potential supplier. So what I would suggest is perhaps that the vast majority of all those risks would fall into one of these nine categories. And an individual firm then, using these categories, can apply their own firm-specific risks. The following slides are going to offer you some examples of each of those. When we look at governmental risks, uh, it was an interesting conversation that I had some time ago with the former president of Intel China. And he was talking about issues of uh, regulatory changes. He said most of the time when Intel found out about new regulations, the way they found out about them was because they were found to be in violation of them. So it's very difficult to, to, to keep track of all the governmental changes in all the, the geographies in which we operate. But a number of different opportunities then to see governmental activity influence supply chain risk. Currency fluctuations, obviously, political unrisk, not unrest in today's world is certainly a, a significant source of risk. Infrastructure. This is a bigger and bigger issue. India today is being touted as one of the low cost areas for sourcing, and, and it's, being, it's very attractive as a, a source for materials for all kinds of different businesses. The problem, of course, is that they have a very difficult infrastructure. Their rail, rail system was devised 40 or 50 years ago, their highway system is inadequate, and their ports are even more inadequate with very limited draft so that even the, the large modern container ships can't access those ports. So infrastructure is a big issue. Our suppliers have all kinds of risks. We can list those for days. But if we look at all these things and we say, OK, um, the importance of supplier visits can't be overstated. How do you know what a supplier is really capable of? How do you know what the supplier's uh, warehouse contains unless we go and look? How do we know that the supplier isn't quite literally operating out of a house someplace? So how do we know that that supplier has the capabilities then to address all of our, our requirements for our growing organizations? It's an ongoing, continuing requirement. We need to look at all the various possible risks that we might encounter from suppliers. We need to go to those suppliers and investigate in detail. Logistics risks, we have Again, continuing difficulty there. On-time delivery is, of course, our most, most over overriding concern. The fundamental objective of supply chain management is continuity of supply. The one thing you don't do as a supply chain manager is shut the production line down because you run out of parts. If you do that, I promise you, that is a career-limiting deficiency. So we want to make sure that continuity of supply we want to make sure that suppliers have the necessary capability, but then we also want to make sure that the logistics part of our, of our supply chain is... Uh, my wife is Italian, see, so I, I, in, I've acquired some of her, uh, some of her uh, mannerisms. On-time delivery, continuity of supply, really important. Um, leakage and shrinkage. Here's a question for you. If we ship 100 cases of Irish whiskey, how many of them will arrive? That's a problem. That's a logistics difficulty. How do we manage the security of our logistics systems? Not only how do we manage the security of our logistics systems so that things don't leak out of the system, but how do we, in today's world, manage our logistics systems so that things don't get injected into the system, things perhaps that go boom. Uh, 
Dr. Darko warned me severely that if I went over time, I was going to be punished. <laughs> so I took my watch off and I put it here so I could be careful not to run over, except my watch fell off the table. External risks, terrorism, obviously. But one of the things that, that we have to be really aware of and, and counter is the issue of cyber attacks. Those have become more and more prevalent. I'm sure everybody has read about the, uh, the cyber attacks that have been uh, affecting a whole lot of the companies around the world, major corporations. If you want to have some fun and you want to waste some time, go to Google and type in forklift accidents and you will see an incredible array of difficulties, accidents that occur that cause significant risk and difficulties within the supply chain. Uh, <coughs> situations like the corporate driver dying, driving down the aisle of a, of a warehouse and with his load, he hits the corner of one of the major stanchions of the, of the pallet racks and he collapses the entire tier of pallet racks with all of its merchandise down on the floor. Accidents happen. Price is always a major concern of ours. Uh, but price trends, the price volatility, especially in today's business environment, and then the influences of global economics on price, all those are concerns of our supply chain risk. External risks comprise exposure to the bottom half of our supply chain, from the buying organization down through our supply chain. But I would argue after many, many investigations that I've conducted, I am fully convinced that as many supply chain risks emanate from within the firm as emanate externally. The firm's practices and its behaviors and its policies create as many supply chain risks as do the other uh, participants in the supply chain. So I would suggest to you that, that we have a number of different categories of supply chain risk and you know, we, we look at each of those then we begin to, uh, to look at, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, we uh, I'm trying to go back. Can we get back to... That's an external left side. That's fine. Thanks, Mark. That's fine. If we look at these, these are, are various possibilities for the externals. But then we also look at, uh, at some of the examples. Uh, we've talked about external risks. Part of the problem with external risks is, as I said, only, it only incorporates part of the supply chain. So then we need to look at some internal risks. And those we've looked at, we've looked at that one. Internal risks, thank you. As we look at the full supply chain, some of the things that that are uh, are internal <coughs> business people, you wonder what happens up here. You wonder how some of these things come about. We look at the, the policies that organizations have. We look at uh, how they manage within the organization, and we wonder about how those those policies then, or the lack thereof, impact supply chain risk. Outsourcing. Policy on outsourcing. In all the companies I've looked at, I have not seen one company that did a really, really good job of calculating total cost. Think about this for a second. Companies that typically outsource to places like Asia where they have low cost to low cost labor, and that's all wonderful. The company looks at the very low price of the product, the company looks at the logistics costs and perhaps tariffs or duties that are associated with that. But what happens when all of a sudden I used to be able to get parts 
in a week from my local supplier. Today, now, it takes me 10 weeks from an agent supplier. What that means then is it takes me 10 weeks to be able to respond to changes in customer demand. What happens during that 10 weeks? All my customers flow to my competitors. And I have that other key piece is the 10-week pipeline inventory that I now have to support as a consequence of my outsourcing policy. Low bid. Uh, as I'm sure all of us realize, when we have a policy like many companies do, that we should have three bids for our major acquisitions, and then we should select the low-cost supplier. As we all well know, though, Cheap suppliers are usually cheap for a reason. <laughs> They're cheap because they don't have enough resources, they don't have enough financing, they don't have the proper people, they don't have enough inventory. There's some very dramatic reasons why they're cheap. So maybe if we look at total cost instead of just price of the product, it gives us a very different answer. Firms that operate on a case-by-case -case basis without any particular strategic direction or without any formal policies and procedures that guide the activities within the organization. All those things are internal activities that create risk. So we have then other questions of risk. Labor, finances of the organization, does the organization have the technology tools that are necessary to operate in today's global environment? Automation technologies, communication technologies, enterprise resource planning technologies that allow them to be globally competitive. Operational risks. Do we have the right people with the right skills? And do those people have the growth capabilities to be able to take on additional responsibilities as our firm grows. Specifications, crucial point. Uh, there is a really interesting pair of pictures that I have for my students. And, and one picture shows a very nice yacht, a beautiful white yacht. The other picture shows the small inflatable tender that serves the yacht. The small tender is called original contract. The big yacht is called change order. So change orders cost an organization a tremendous amount of money. They're very expensive. Clearly the markup on change orders is dramatically different than the markup on the original contract. Forecasting. One of the things that organizations tend to do least well, we forecast very badly, yet everything we do in supply chain management hangs off of a marketing forecast. Once the marketing people determine how much they're going to sell next year, then we in operations have to figure out how we're going to find be able to produce that. Uh, do I have the right number of people on my shop floor? Do I have the right equipment? Do I have the supplies lined up so that I can have continuous production? All those things are driven by the marketing forecast. Everything that we do depends upon the accuracy of that marketing forecast. And I will also share with you one thing that I thought was pretty alarming. One of the classes that I teach is the Oregon Executive MBA program. That program primarily is attended by people who are middle and upper manager, managers at Intel, uh, bank presidents, uh, hospital directors. It's a fairly high level organ, uh, class. Uh, and, and as a consequence, the first thing I ask those, that class to do is to write two pages and tell me what their, uh, what their forecasting processes are and what difficulties they encounter as a consequence of their forecasting. The, thing, the responses that I get year after year are pretty alarming. People don't forecast what they think is really going to happen. The responses say, I forecast to satisfy my direct report. I forecast to satisfy my boss. Well, no wonder we have such a difficulty in forecasting, yet it's a critical piece and it creates an enormous amount of supply chain risk. Obviously, ethics is a huge issue in supply chain risk. The first 
class, the first evening of the purchasing class, that's a required part of our supply chain management program. The first evening, there are always a few students eager who not only have bought the book ahead of time, but actually read a few pages. And so I always ask them, what's the most important thing in supply chain management? And of course, they give me all the textbook answers. The right goods at the right time, at the right price at the right place, and I keep saying no, 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 until they run out of textbook answers. My view is the most important thing in supply chain management is ethics. That is the foundation upon which all of our business relationships with all of our suppliers are built. If we have a, a relationship built upon unethical behavior, those are destined to collapse without, without question. On that note, I'd like to turn then to the second of the major concerns, which is sustainability. As I'm sure everyone is aware, the, the sustainability model has three basic foundations. The first one is environmental sustainability, then the social responsibility piece, and finally the organizational sustainability. How do we keep the company profitable while still doing the things that are right? Environmental sustainability, here are some examples. <clears throat> the use of non-renewable resources, how do I minimize that? minimize my energy consumption, minimize the, uh, the damaging material that I put back into the river, min minimize the amount of, of uh, smoke and other damaging things that I put into the atmosphere, and finally the use of hazardous materials. But equally importantly, how do I go about disposing of the, those hazardous wastes that are the byproduct of the use of those haz hazardous materials? How do I go about doing that in an environmentally acceptable way? Social responsibility is the second piece. How do I go about making sure that, first of all, we treat our employees well, that we have ethical standards for our organization, and that with regard to uh, gender equity, we have equal pay for women who do the same job as men. We have removed the glass ceiling so that women can ascend in the hierarchy of the organization the same way men can that we pay on a living wage, and more importantly, that we see that our suppliers pay a living wage to their uh, employer, employees as well. So how do we go about making sure that the way that we interact with our employees and, and our suppliers and their people is, is uh, in, a, in a socially responsible way? Organizational sustainability, of course, we need to be, continue to be profitable. We have to make sure, though, that in the process of doing that, we employ suppliers and we employ practices that uh, make our customers friendly to us so that we don't end up in a situation where, uh, like I'll describe in a minute, where the activities of our suppliers reflect badly on our organization and as a consequence our ability to market effectively. Long-term viability is, of course, critical. Some past research, after looking at several hundred articles, the one thing that becomes immediately clear to me is that if we look at supply chain risk and then we look at sustainability, those two have been examined in isolation. Yet, if we think about it in another way, those things almost inevitably interact. And I'll show you in a minute here what I'm, what I'm thinking about that. And this is the, the second key piece of this research. If you look at it in, in one way, what we see is that we have, on the one hand, the internal actions, the internal policies, and the actions of our supply chain flowing down from the buy-in company that, that are uh, generators of supply chain risk. On the other hand, we have the sustainability, the three major elements of sustainability. And the interactions of those are always really interesting. I know this is a busy slide, but if you take a look at the two, the two primary categories of activity, supply chain risk on one hand and sustainability on the other, if you take any one and you ask yourself how does that interact with the other side, and then you can do it in the reverse direction. How does any, any activity on the, on the sustainability side interact back with, with the uh, uh, supply chain risk side? And let me give you some examples of exactly how those things happen. 
First of all, an organization that has a policy that says we will always buy from the low-cost supplier. That typically means that that supplier is going to be in a distant location, typically Asia, because of low-cost labor. Which